Hello, uh, welcome. My name is Catherine Ritz, and I'm delighted to join the NFLC 2022 Virtual Summit. Um, and I'm uh, my presentation will focus on the MAFLA Proficiency Academy. Uh, MAFLA stands for Massachusetts Foreign Language Association, so that's the State World Language Teacher Association in Massachusetts. Um, and this was a is a collaborative professional development that has helped many teachers on the path to proficiency. So I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, I have been working with MAFLA, or volunteering, I should say, with MAFLA since 2011. Um, so it's been over 10 years that I've uh, volunteered with MAFLA and have absolutely loved this work. So if I think back to my like my professional paid career and like my service career um, through MAFLA and other professional associations, the MAFLA Proficiency Academy is a highlight for me. Uh, it's something I'm incredibly proud of and I'm excited to share this, the structure of this event uh, with you all. Um, so I, I'll talk more about it in, in a couple of minutes to give you an overview, but just to say this has been a really, uh, exciting and engaging professional development event that has launched, I think, over 500 teachers in our state. We've had around 100 uh, people come every summer that we've run it um, and has been really exciting in launching groups um, on the path to teaching for proficiency. Um, so thank you for joining me, and I hope this um, presentation will be useful for you if you're a state leader or you're looking for a way to structure professional development to support teachers even within your school uh, if you're a, if you're a, a school leader um, I hope this will be helpful so we launched the MAFLA proficiency Academy in 2015 so prior to that we were running MAFLA runs an annual fall conference so that was our largest event we get around 800 people will come to our fall conference and then we had two other generally we're running two other professional development events um, uh, for the rest during the rest of the year um, these were primarily like language specific um, so we were um, we were running two events, one in the spring, one in the summer, um, and they offer really catered to French, Spanish, and Latin teachers. Um, we had a little, a few some events that were more general, um, but that that was it. Um, we so we had a I think an opportunity there to expand and really shift the focus on teaching for proficiency. Um, other context that's relevant, our state curriculum framework um, had not been updated at the time since 1999. It was only just updated a year ago. Um, so the state, the Department of Education, um, or the department was called the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE in Massachusetts, also had no state supervisor for world languages. We now thankfully do. Um, but honestly, I think we felt as a state organization that we, if, if no one else sort of stepped up to help teachers shift to teaching for proficiency, it just wasn't going to happen in our state. So the Department of Ed and our curriculum framework were not supporting teaching for proficiency. Um, so we had a sense that there was really kind of limited understanding of, of proficiency um, and pr certainly proficiency based instruction that we wanted to address. Um, the other important thing um, as we thought about this event um, was really the goal. I, we wanted to bring in national presenters and really build a, a solid knowledge base around proficiency-based instruction. Financially, this was a big risk for MAFLA. Um, I remember the board meetings where we were looking at the costs and we were sort of trying to figure out how we we're going to make this work. We'd never done something like this before, so we felt it was really risky. Um, and I think happily we've broken even or made a small profit um, in every year that we've run this event. Um, the other thing that was really important to me as the director of this event was ensuring that we were uh, designing it around best practices for professional development. So you'll see an article referenced at the bottom here um, uh, by Desimone and Garrett um, that looked at best practices um, in teacher PD in the United States, so nationwide. So they pulled together uh, a couple of key characteristics of professional development that helped ensure uh, it was effective. So you see them here, clear content focused. So certainly our content was world language education. So we knew we were addressing that. 
active learning on the part of per uh, participants. So we knew we wanted to make sure people weren't just sort of sitting there listening, but that everyone was active. Um, collective participation, which means that people are, teachers are working collaboratively to develop material for their own classes. So they're not just, you know, not only just listening and being actively discussing, but that they're also working together uh, to create things for their own class. So there's like a, a practical application. Um, there's coherent goals and, in the focus and the outcome. So we had a really clear focus of what we wanted people to achieve through this event. Um, and then the last criteria that they noted is what's called, they call sustained duration. Um, so that means that the PD shouldn't just be like a one-off, that it needs to be something that is really sustained uh, for a while. So this was the one we, we felt we really weren't able to meet. This was a four day event and I'll share the schedule with you. But um, in terms of being sustained across, for example, an entire school year, uh, that wasn't something we could achieve through a summer professional development event. So we did have longer than sort of a one day or one hour workshop. We had this really deep focus over four long days, but we knew we couldn't reach into people's classrooms for the following year. So that was the one piece that we weren't able to address in the design of this event. So our first year we launched in 2015 um, and we had one strand. Uh, we were hosted at Westfield State University. So in Massachusetts, that's sort of um, like what central mass. Um, it's a really pretty campus. Um, and four days we had on-campus dorms where uh, people could sleep over. Uh, and we sort of started joking around that this was our world language teacher sleepaway camp. Um, not everyone stayed on campus. Some people were sort of commuting, which is fine, but uh, we were really like all day immersed, uh, really long days. And who else but Greg Duncan could we invite uh, as our featured national presenter? Um, so to build, so again, clear content focus, clear learning outcomes, um, we're all embedded in here. People were active in Greg's presentations with lots of like turn and talks and discussion and all of that. But then that collaborative piece, um, we built in through um, what we call facilitated breakout sessions in the afternoon. So every afternoon, so we people were getting sort of a, a direct presentation from Greg in the morning, uh, a short one also after lunch, and then they would go into breakout groups for around two hours, um, and Greg set some tasks for people to accomplish. Um, so we had um, we had around 100 people this first year. So I think we had four to five breakout groups, um, actually more, yeah, five at least uh, breakout groups. Uh, so we tried to keep, um, and we hired people who were experts in the field. So local, um, local people who had uh, been doing this kind of work for a while, um, uh, we were all still learning. Um, and, you know, but these are people who we thought would be really strong in helping facilitate discussion and collaboration. So the breakout rooms time, I mean, what was happening there was really, um, we'd start with, so I facilitated the first year and then afterwards it was too much. I was too busy working on the rest of the event. Um, but, you know, my goal there was to like, okay, like, you know, questions that came up. So give people some processing time. Like, what did you learn? What, what were your questions? What were you challenged by? Like, what do you want to think more about? And then, okay, we have a task. So Greg's tasked us with setting proficiency targets for our district, for example, let's work on that. And people could work sort of in smaller groups within that larger, you know, 15 person um, breakout group. Um, so we really wanted people to walk away with concrete uh, material that they could bring back to their classrooms the following year. So that breakout time was really, really crucial. And then we came back together at the end of the day uh, to meet again with Greg, reflect on the learning, sort of sum up uh, some of the key points from that day. Um, here, I, I just tried to pull together some photos um, uh, to sort of uh, share some of it. And this was also our flyer that first year. So we really tried to highlight the collaboration sort of at this time, remember, we like proficiency was really, really new. It wasn't really happening in our state unless you were a motivated teacher kind of going on your own. Um, this wasn't something that we were really talking about um, extensively at the state level, except through some of the presentations at our fall conference. So this was still really, really new throughout the state. Um, and you can see um, we we had these wonderful sort of posters that people made at the end of the um, uh, end of the proficiency academy, summing up sort of some of their ways. And you see some of those presentations here. So I think in addition to um, everything else, it was also really fun and and collaborative. 
Um, in year two, we invited Greg back um, to continue. Uh, at the time, we called it our novice strand, which we ended up changing to foundations because it was confusing to teachers. They're like, I'm not a novice teacher, either like a beginning teacher or I'm teaching novices. Um, that was a confusing term. So we changed it to foundations. But in any case, in our second year, Greg came back and basically did the same thing again. It was like, okay, so for whoever didn't make it to the first year, you have a chance to come this year. So it was sort of every year we ended up offering this foundation strand so people could come and learn about um, teaching for proficiency. Um, and then we wanted to add a uh, more advanced strand for people who had already gone through Greg's strand, which we called principles of proficiency. And, and that focus we changed, ended up changing every year. So in the first year that we had the principles of proficiency strand, uh, Thomas Auer uh, graced us with his uh, presence and focused on curriculum design. We kept the breakout sessions. Um, so, you know, again, we had morning presentations from in two groups from Greg and Thomas, um, lots of interaction. And then after lunch, people went into their breakout facilitated breakout groups where they were sort of reflecting, processing, and then coming up with a, a product, a task or something that they wanted um, to, that there was like applying their learning and they could bring it back to the school district the following year. The other piece that we added that I think is actually my favorite component of the Proficiency Academy were these uh, what we called proficiency in my district uh, presentations. And so um, I sort of looked at the roster and was like, okay, who's coming back that was here last year? And, you know, just tell us your story. How, what have you done? So um, these were sort of either department heads or teachers that were alumni. They had gone through Greg Strand, the foundation strand, and now they'd had a year in the classroom. And then they're back again the next summer and like, well, okay, how did it go? Like, what did you do? Um, what worked? What was hard? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I have some links to some videos of that to share. Um, but really, that was that was a highlight. And, you know, for me, like I can go both. I can go theory, and, and, but I'm also very like practical. So I was like, all these theoretical things are great, but like, what does this look like, like tomorrow? What does this look like in practice? So I wanted to help bridge that connection between these like abstract theoretical conversations to something that's like, here's what it looks like. Here's what we did specifically. Here's what was hard. Here's what worked um, and so on. So th those were absolutely wonderful to sort of hear real examples from teachers and department chairs uh, on what they were doing. Um, here's a couple more photos from that first, that second year rather, um, and I, it was, we actually didn't have a t-shirt making contest, but this, this uh, teacher ended up making one on her own with a group that she was um, in the dorms with, um, which I absolutely loved. Um, and you can see the collaboration here. Um, Thomas had attendees do something really great on the last day. They had to write down a belief that they had held at the beginning of the uh, academy and sort of throw it away. So they read it and threw it away. I don't believe this anymore. I really shift my thinking around this. It was really wonderful. Uh, wonderful. And I, I think many of us, I remember being in tears. It was just really powerful. Um, I'm going to share the schedule for you because in actually like we pretty much kept the same schedule, which was surprising. You, there's a few tweaks, like five minutes here and there, but the schedule really stayed the same. So um, this worked for us. Um, so you can see here, we were Monday through Thursday, so four days. We had like an opening welcome on day one. And then the green that you see here is Greg's um, sessions. So those were the titles of his session. So that's the content he was focusing on. So starting with proficiency levels, how do I design pro proficiency targets? Um, and then going into the breakout sessions. And the blue is what Thomas had di did for the, the principles of proficiency curriculum. Um, uh, actually, this might've been from his next year, which I'll talk about in a second, um, uh, where we had a different focus of the principles and proficiency, but you get the idea here. So you see um, sort of, we started together, we went into the two separate strands, uh, we all had lunch together, and then we had this proficiency in my classroom or my district presentation back into our strands, had a little break, and then we were in the breakout sessions for two hours um, to really, again, like design our tasks, process learning, and then came back together for closing. We also had dinner together. These were like super long days. We were on, because everyone, many people were staying on campus. Um, so the, you know, that like informal lunch and meal time was a great opportunity to keep talking about our learning. Um, here's the second day. 
um, agenda. I won't read through it, but you see the same sort of pattern, the morning content focus, lunch, another focus in the afternoon, and then breakout sessions. Um, and this was our Wednesday, same structure. And then finally, Thursday, we ended at like 4 p.m. Um, and it was really nice. We decided to come back together, the entire, both of the strands together for the very final activity, um, where uh, I think we often would make these sort of posters reflecting on our learning, um, which was awesome. Um, so here's year three. Um, so we kept again the principle, the foundations of proficiency strand. Uh, every year, Greg and I would joke like, "Are we going to have more people coming next year?" And every year, he had um, we had a new cohort of teachers who hadn't engaged in this work yet, and were excited to have the opportunity to start their learning on the path to proficiency. Um, and then Thomas Hour came back again and focused this year on assessment and feedback, and we kept. The breakout sessions, we kept the proficiency in my district presentations as well. So then it was like three new um, presenters who had been alumni and were kind of coming back and sharing their journey. And here's some of our photos um, uh, that, uh, and the post, you see an example of the poster, um, discussions are the big group. Uh, it was just really, really wonderful. Um, in year four, we invited Greta Lundegaard for the principles of proficiency, and she focused on developing a proficiency focused classroom. So some more like in depth lesson design uh, perspectives. Um, and Greg, again, back for foundations. And again, we had a big turnout in his strand uh, for teachers that were beginning their journey. So it was really exciting. So the schedule really after year two, the, the schedule really stayed. We found that it worked really effectively. Uh, and here's a couple more uh, photos and our, our flyer from that year. In year five, Tom, we invited Thomas Hour back again, um, and he focused on advanced curriculum and lesson design for uh, pro the principles of proficiency strand, but same structure, same, same setup, same everything, and three new proficiency in my district presenters. Uh, and here's a couple, couple photos here just to show you the collaboration. The top photo you see on the right, that's from our breakout sessions where people were just working together um, in different classrooms. And then some of the interactive work that was happening in, in the bottom photo in the large uh, strand. COVID hit 2020. We had everything lined up for 2020 and uh, COVID hit. We decided that this event, the collaborative nature of this wasn't really gonna translate well into an online learning. Uh, we did something else uh, to support teachers during those two years, but we did take a two year hiatus during COVID. Um, but 2022, this summer, we are back and excited to, oops, uh, welcome Leslie Gran as our principles of proficiency pr uh, presenter. So she's presenting on proficiency for all learners, but Greg is back. We once again have a huge enrollment uh, for teachers who are still new. At this point where we are now in 2022, we now finally have a new world language curriculum framework in Massachusetts. And we have a department, a world language specialist at the Department of Education. Um, so the push, I think, towards teacher schools adopting the new curriculum framework has really motivated uh, maybe some of the teachers or districts that were more reluctant to shift towards teaching for, for proficiency to finally uh, dive in. So there, I think, our foundation strand, we're seeing that real big um, excitement because of that. That's been really exciting. And we have I uh, have some lined up some presenters again to talk about the proficiency in my district. Um, so we're really excited. It's going to be a great summer again. Here's a couple of more photos from the previous years um, uh, on this event. Um, so I wanted to share briefly what a little bit more about the proficiency in my district presentations. Um, and for me, again, as I said, this was really a highlight um from my perspective so these were alumni of the proficiency academy and my goal in inviting people to present was to give everyone a real world example of how programs uh, are making the shift towards teaching for proficiency so i went through my emails and was like what did i ask presenters to do every year and these were the questions I wanted them to share and really be honest and candid, like what has changed in your district as a result of coming to this event? What worked? What was challenging? And what are your next steps? Um, 
I remember getting feedback on the what is challenging people. I think people really appreciated just sort of hearing like the honest take, like here's what worked really, really well and we were excited about and here's what was challenging and we're still working on. Um, and again, it was just giving a concrete example um, of what all of this looks like in practice. So trying to like demystify proficiency-based instruction and be like, here's what it looks like, here's what we did. Um, you'll see here on uh, YouTube two of the district presentations. You're welcome to, to follow those links if you'd like to see two of the presentations uh, from, from various districts. It was really exciting and expiring. Um, so every year, of course, we asked for feedback um, on what was working, what we needed to do um, to make things better. Um, there were sort of two, there was lots of wonderful feedback. There were two points I wanted to highlight for this presentation. Um, two of the things people really, so one of the things people really loved was the collaboration. Um, so some of the quotes I pulled out here um, really speak to how important this is for, for teachers. So the first one, working with my colleagues on creating department-wide resources. In the past, I felt isolated on the road towards proficiency, but now that other colleagues have been trained, they're truly on board and the implementation of what we have learned. So we had a number of districts that would come in, in groups, small, maybe it was just two people, maybe it was you know seven people that would come from the same school district um, and had a chance to collaborate. Uh, another teacher said, I was finally able to speak with other teachers about ways to actually apply this in a real setting. That was most convincing to me that I could make this shift in my own teaching. I truly enjoyed talking with other educators about where this field is going. Um, it's so important to help us change um, our, what she called a broken education system. By talking with other professionals, we're able to create a network of teachers who are going to be great resources during our journey. Um, and I think the last quote as well is really important. So uh, this teacher commented, the concepts made more sense to me, made sense to me as I went through them with Thomas. But when I tried to put them in practice, I felt stumped. Collaborating with my colleagues, so that would be during those breakout sessions, helped to minimize that. So really the collaboration was so important. And along the same lines, um, a lot of really positive comments were on the breakout sessions. They were extraordinarily helpful, great chance to debrief and process. Um, talking with members of my own department. Um, the second quote you see, she, this teacher commented, professional learning ends up being an individual activity um, in which individual reflection happens and adding a group reflection was extremely helpful. Uh, and the last one commented how much the breakout sessions made a difference in terms of application of new ideas, uh, going from the big picture to sort of more narrow, those sort of focused uh, practical steps to apply. Um, so we really had a lot of powerful feedback from our attendees um, and department leaders. And, you know, I'm a former department head. Um, and I, so my network is a lot of other world language department chairs in my state. And many of them commented like, this was the event that like helped tip the balance in their, or tip the scale in their school district, where they were able to come with teachers who were like, I don't know about this whole teaching for proficiency thing, we'll see. And then after attending, we're like 100% on board, really motivated and excited to make changes. Um, and some who have said even like, I can't go back, I will never go back to the sort of grammar based instruction of the past. No way I, I refuse to work in a school like that even um, after they had made this shift. Um, I did want to comment on the sustained duration, if you remember from those sort of key principles of effective professional development. Um, I was really interested, so I'm now at Boston University and have had to do some, not really a researcher, but just some research in my position. So I was super curious, like, well, what's happening for teachers after they leave this event? We're getting this great feedback. Um, is it really like as powerful as we think it is what's happening in the classroom? So I ended up um, following a, a few teachers and observed them a couple of times during the school year um, and interviewed them. It was just like, you know, what's working, what's not working, what's hard, you know, and then I could sort of observe their teaching to sort of see really it, what's really happening in their instruction, what's changed. Um, and you'll see the link there to the article that published that information. Um, the sustained duration piece like that is really key. And what I noticed in the teachers that I looked at was a school that had strong leadership, a strong leadership structure, um, the teacher was more likely to be successful. So where an individual, if there was like 
you're still the lone teacher trying to make these shifts in your classroom, it was really, really hard. Um, so to my mind, that really speaks to the importance of, you know, that sustaining the learning throughout the school year, uh, which is going to happen with a good leadership structure. So I would certainly speak out or reach out to other, if you're a department leader, how important your role is in um, in supporting your teachers in this work. And just to say also, I think a summer professional development event as wonderful as I think this event was, was it's one piece of the puzzle. Um, I want to close with uh, a, my favorite video from the Proficiency Academy. One of the activities that Greg and Thomas had us uh, do was an elevator pitch. I think this is from Greg's, one of Greg's many foundation years. Uh, this is from 2019. Um, so they're doing an elevator pitch, trying to convince uh, someone that they should shift to teaching for proficiency. Was your language learning experience terrible? No. Uh, did, you take, <laughs> did you take four years of a language and only remember hola, bonjour, or guten tag? Yeah. Uh, would you like to hear about a better way to learn a language than the way you learned? What? Sure. Yeah. I have an approach called proficiency proficiency based learning that creates a sustained interest and motivates and energizes learners to become better speakers. No. Oh. Students can apply their language skills in real life situations in order to communicate and connect with others on a path to global citizenship. Wow. It engages language learners through authentic scenarios and technology and students gain confidence in their ability to communicate and connect with native speakers. So say goodbye to old school cool. language instructions and say hello to proficiency. Um, oops, so really, really fun. Um, ah. Sorry, activity. So thank you so much for listening. I hope if you're a state leader or a district leader that you found this helpful. I wish you all well on your path to proficiency. Uh, thank you to the NFLC for letting me share uh, our experiences at MAFLA. And I also wanna give a big thank you to the MAFLA Board of Directors for supporting this work. Again, this was a risk for us when we first started it and it's been really supported through a lot of hard work over the many years that we've been offering this event. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the summit. Bye everyone.